Item of business is a debate on motion 7740 in the name of Angela Constance on dignity, equality and human rights for all. Can I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons, please? And I call on Angela Constance to speak to and move the motion uh, up to 10 minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I have uh, a great pleasure in opening today's debate on dignity, equality and human rights for all. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, proclaimed by the United Nations General Assembly in 1948, articulates what I believe to be a, a self-evident truth. And that is that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and in rights. And there is a sense in which any debate on dignity, equality and human rights necessarily begins and ends right there uh, with that simple statement. Almost everything we need to do in the world of government and public policy and legislation and in our roles as elected representatives can be derived directly from our acceptance of that single sentence. In fact, nothing that we do and nothing that we seek to achieve can ultimately have meaning if it does not strive above all else to give practical effect to the principles of freedom and equality, to human rights and the overriding obligation to secure human dignity. It is certainly a truth that shapes our collective response in government and indeed in this parliament to critically important domestic challenges. From the elimination of poverty, ill health and inequality to the delivery of inclusive and environmentally sustainable economic growth, these universal principles uh, directly inform our work. And it is a truth that lies at the heart of how we confront as a nation and as a society uh, the prospect of life post-Brexit. And it is a truth that reminds us, if a reminder is indeed needed, of the monstrous tragedy that we see unfolding in Myanmar and of the continuing scandal of modern wealthy nations which fail in their duty to alleviate the suffering of refugees cast up on European shores. Of course, the, the work of both government and of this parliament is also shaped by our common responsibilities to do more than simply acknowledge big principles. We also have a, a shared duty to get the details right, to ensure that we achieve the outcomes the people of Scotland have tasked us to deliver. In doing so requires a human rights approach. It demands ways of working that embed dignity and rights and equality in everything that we do. And it recognises that such action is more than just a policy choice or a consequence of the most recent uh, manifesto commitment. In other words, it's not just what we do, important though that crucially is, it's also about how what we do. It's about how we do our business, it's about how we implement our commitments. It's about how we include others. It's how we work uh, with those and listen to those and respond to those that we seek to serve. And giving practical effect to quality uh, and human rights and securing hu human dignity for all is, of course, uh, a core function of government and also of this parliament. As Scotland's government, we have a, a particular responsibility uh, not only to lead that work, but to be accountable uh, for our record and delivering. And that is why the, the programme for government that we set out on the 5th of September uh, provides an ambitious roadmap uh, for long-term uh, progressive change. It builds on the actions that we have already taken to make human rights real in Scotland and to enable all members of our society to live uh, with dignity and equality. And we have made clear that the Scottish Government uh, will maintain a resolute defence of human rights and equality in the face of threats posed by the UK Government. And we will work to prevent existing and future human rights protections, including the Charter of Fundamental Rights being eroded by the impact of Brexit. <laughs> the Charter, the European Charter of Fundamental Rights is crucially important because it has a, a direct effect in this country and it also complements uh, the ECHR, 
We know that the Scotland Act and the Human Rights Act implements ECHR in Scotland. But crucially, the European Charter actually goes further than the European Convention on Human Rights because it includes its social, economic, cultural and third generation rights around employment, environment and consumer protection, amongst others. And we are determined uh, also to take every opportunity to give further and better effect to those economic, social and cultural and third, gener rights, third generation rights for all of Scotland. Certainly. Adam Tompkins. Very grateful to the Cabinet Secretary for, giving, for, for making way on this point. I mean, the, the, the European Charter on Fundamental Rights and Freedoms applies only to the EU institutions and to EU member states when they are implementing EU law in national law. Given that we're leaving the EU, the Charter can't have any further effect in the United Kingdom post-Brexit, can it? Angela Constance. Actually, if Mr Tompkins had uh, listened uh, to what I was saying, that of course uh, that the EU Charter uh, and its principles has a direct impact on laws in Scotland as they stand and gives us protections that we all benefit from. And what we don't want to see is a UK Tory government erode those protections. And further still, we have to recognise that the European Charter of Fundamental Rights complements and actually goes further than the European Convention of Human Rights for reasons uh, that I have exemplified, because it includes social security, economic rights, cultural rights, uh, social rights. And these are the rights which are included in our vision of fair work, something that this government, and actually I believe most uh, of this parliament is in favour of. But these rights not only include the right to fair work or an adequate standard of living, decent housing, health, social security, access to education. These are the things that we now need to stand up collectively and protect in the face of a UK government and the Brexit process. And that is one of the reasons, no, perhaps later if I've got time. That's why we're establishing an expert advisory group to make recommendations on how Scotland can continue to lead by example. And that group will be chaired by Professor Alan Miller, former head of the Scottish Human Rights Commission. And its work will be founded in participation and a deliberative approach, one that reaches beyond those who already have easy access to power and influence. And human rights belong to everyone in our society. And it is essential that voices from all walks of life, from every corner of our nation are heard. And we're also continuing to put the rights of our children and young people at the heart of the programme for government, including by conducting a comprehensive audit of ways to further embed the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and Domestic Law. And we know that Scotland has a strong track record in empowering and involving children and young people so that their voices too can be clearly heard. This government has also been explicit in recognising social security as a human right, that commitment remains uh, at the heart of our programme uh, of Scotland's new social security system uh, and how it will be founded on dignity and respect. And we are determined too that Scotland should be a place where disabled people uh, can live with real opportunity to realise their potential free from the barriers that hold them back. That commitment to disabled people's rights was acknowledged uh, by the United Nations last month when it welcomed publication of our disability delivery plan. Later this year, presiding officer, we will publish an action plan which will drive positive change for minority ethnic communities in Scotland. We'll publish our delivery plan for Equally Safe, detailing our programme to tackle violence against women and girls. And we're also implementing Scotland's human trafficking and exploitation strategy, which is about supporting victims, identifying perpetrators and addressing uh, the causes of trafficking and exploitation. And we also have an ambitious programme of work to take forward the recommendations of the independent advisory group uh, on hate crime, prejudice and community cohesion. And many of these issues feature among the 227 recommendations uh, made by the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council following its review in May of the UK's uh, human rights record. And over the last two years, the UK has been examined uh, by the UN committees on its record under five of the seven core international human rights treaties. In relation to disabled people in particular, the UK has been found to have been engaged in grave and systematic violations. Indeed, 
Such are the concerns that the UK has been ordered to report back on progress next year. And members of the United Nations Human Rights Council have made clear their own concerns that the legal protections in place in the UK to safeguard human rights are increasingly at risk. And those are concerns and criticisms which this government shares and which we remained uh, absolutely committed uh, to addressing. Presiding officer, this month marks 20 years uh, since the referendum vote for the Scottish Parliament. The vote was a watershed moment for Scotland and its democracy. From the outset, equality and human rights were embedded in the very fabric of this institution as a founding principle uh, for Scotland's new parliament. In the 20 years since, those principles and ambitions have remained firm and have informed all that we do. Much work still remains uh, to be done, but I am proud of the commitment that this government and indeed this parliament has made to equality, to human rights, and to the fundamental importance of human dignity. And I am proud of the stance that has been taken to protect uh, those rights. And we can be confident that the self-evident truth articulated by the Universal Declaration uh, will, I believe, uh, ultimately triumph if we continue to work diligently and in partnership to give full and meaningful effect. And that is the work which I know that this government and Scotland's national parliament are both fully committed to. And I move the motion in my name. I now call Pauline McNeill to speak to and move Amendment 7740.3. I move the amendment in my name. It isn't just our signature to the various treaties and conventions on human rights that matter, but rather how we take them forward and use those conventions to improve the law on human rights, but make the lives of those most in need of protection against prejudice, discrimination and poverty. I'd like to associate the Labour Party with the remarks of the Minister, Cabinet Minister, in relation to the treatment of Rohingya Muslims by the Myanmar province, it should be condemned worldwide as ethnic cleansing. There is a great deal to focus on in this coming Parliament, inclusive education in our schools, transphobia, the rights of transgender people, tackling disability discrimination in employment, smashing the barriers preventing women from equal and fair representation in all levels of their profession, whether it be in public, and in private, in the boardroom. But the concept and definition of human rights by its very nature, I agree, should be a wide one, not only confined to gender, disability, race and religion, and sexual orientation, but also to other protections, such as protections in the workplace, the right to join a union, the right for dignity and ill health, and old age, and environmental protection rights. Friends of the Earth draws our attention in their briefing um, about the high cost of taking action in relation to environmental rights. But uh, my observation is this is also true in areas of civil justice where people try and enforce their rights. And the subject of legal cost to ordinary citizens, I think, is a serious piece of work that needs to be looked at in this parliament. We will support the government motion and all the other motions. We will be abstaining on the Liberal Democrat motion until we've heard the outcome of the Human Rights and Equality Committee's work on prisoner voting. In many cases, parliaments have, be have gone beyond the legal convention requirements, such as the legislation on equal marriage and gender recognition, and credit is due to former Prime Minister David Cameron for the equal marriage across the UK, and of the Scottish Government for the implementing it into to Scots law. And we should continue to make sure that Scotland is ahead of the trend here, as we have been. I'm happy to give way to Sandra White very briefly. Sandra White. I, I thank the member for taking the intervention. I, I recollect just a couple of seconds ago, you mentioned the fact that people should have a right to join a trade union. Uh, I just wonder, uh, Anna Sarwar, would you say that the workers there have a right to join a trade union? Polly McNeill. I have no idea why Sandra White thinks that I would disagree with, with, with that statement, but uh, that's perhaps for another day. But Labour is proud. We are proud of our time enshrining the European Convention of Human Rights into domestic law, and we are proud of the decision to do that and we will continue to defend that decision. Some would even say that a smoking ban... Some would even say that a smoking ban 
is an important human rights question in the traditional sense, the right not to breathe in damaging smoke. It, nonetheless, it was a life-changing act. There have been many benefits of law that have prevented people from enforcing their human rights. Being part of the European Union did give workers rights that they had to ensure that they have holiday pay they previously didn't and ensure that employers now have to include overtime in calculating that holiday pay. The Tory proposals to remove ECHR from our current law is a backward step. It's not easy for countries to accept decisions that they don't agree with, but it is an important check on balance and laws from time to time. If it wasn't for the Supreme Court's decision implementing the ECHR principles, then uh, suspects of crimes would not have the right to have a lawyer present during their questioning. They overturned a seven bench decision of the appeal court, and I think they got it right. In my closing minute, presiding officer, I just wanted to talk about the UK's role in immigration and, and the detention estate is one of the largest in Europe. Between 2009 and 2016, two to three and a half thousand people were held in detention at any given time. I believe it is a principle of human rights law to have the right to enter a place of detention as an elected member um, at any, at any uh, point. Um, I have been refused as an elected member by the Minister Robert Goodwill the right to go and see for myself the conditions in which detainees are held. We cannot hold ourselves up to be a progressive country if we do not hold, uphold the, the right for elected members um, to, to be able to see for themselves the conditions um, in which those are held. And I realise I have to... Uh, I can. You can have on. another minute, Ms McNeill, okay. if you really, really want one. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just close at this presiding, presiding officer. I didn't want to get on your wrong side there. Um, I, I think that as a really important principle of human rights, and I urge members to support me in this and to, and to write to, to David Mundell, who I've also written to, who seems to be supporting this decision, that all of us, if we're going to uphold human rights and the conditions in which uh, asylum seekers and people in places of detention are held, and that's all of our prisons and all of our places of detention, we must go and see for ourselves, not to disrupt the regime, but just simply to uphold that principle. And I'll finish on that, presiding officer. Thank you. I now call John Finney to speak to and move amendment 7740.1. You've up to five minutes, please, Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. And I move the amendment in my name. Um, and I think there's a lot of common ground already. We've heard there that the Scottish Government motion talks about Scottish security system based on dignity and respect. And I, I, I certainly would hope everyone would uh, go along with that. Um, and also the recognition of social security as a human right. I think that's a very much a fundamental thing. I could also commend taking things a bit further and incorporating Article 9 of the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights and also relevant sections of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People. That's a position that's supported by the Child Poverty Action Group and also Inclusion Scotland. Now, the motion does discuss equality, fairness and rights, but doesn't mention disability rights or the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. I appreciate it's a big area. Um, um, but the omission is notable for a number of uh, reasons. That is that the CRPD is the most recent uh, UN Human Rights Treaty and less than a year ago, though this has been alluded to, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability, which oversees the CRPD, concluded an inquiry into the UK um, and found system, systematic violations of rights. Indeed, about three weeks ago, the same committee concluded in its multi-annual uh, monitoring process on the UK and agreed a report recommending 85 uh, uh, courses of action. Um, and there's a number of rights uh, alluded to there, uh, a range of rights, some of which have been touched upon. And these are the rights to health care, social welfare, education, to participate in society. And of all the debates we have in here, a, a, another area where there's a lot of commonality is the, the, the view that we should be an inclusive society. There's nothing should mark um, people out um, as being unable to participate. And indeed, if a UK government has put in place mechanisms that do that, then that, of course, is very damning. To an adequate standard of living. Uh, these are substantive uh, rights in their own regard, not simply a right to enjoy services on a non-discriminatory basis. That's something completely different. So touching on the specifics of that inquiry, the inquiry found systematic uh, violations of basic rights, including, as I've said, the right to independent living and being included in the community, 
um, uh, an adequate standard of living and social protection. And if, the, if that legislation is about anything, surely it's about protecting people to work in employment. And they, they were very clear on the cause of these violations. It was identified as the welfare, welfare reforms unequivocally as a result of the welfare reforms introduced in the context of austerity. And both specific measures and the combined impact of the range of measures are identified. And the specific measures include the loss of access to motability cars under personal independent payment rollout, which replaced uh, disability living allowance. And many of us will recall the uh, Conservative leader joyriding on, on a, a motability scooter during the recent election campaign and how uh, distasteful that was to so many people. Also, ESA and the high level of recipients placed in work-related activity group and the high number of work-related activity group participa participants who were sanctioned. And the committee also singled out impact assessments. Impact assessments are clearly pivotal in making, uh, understanding the, the consequences of policies we enact. And they, they, they were conducted by the state and they foresaw an adverse impact on dis disabled people, yet these policies were still implemented. And that clearly is very damning. The committee also highlighted the absence of a cumulative rights-based impact assessment. Now, um, I think it's only fair having um, laid out that to say what the UK government has said about that. The UK government dismissed the committee's findings as, and I quote, patronising and offensive. Well, what's patronising and offensive is anyone who holds surgeries, anyone who has members of the public come through their door seeking assistance. What's patronising and offensive is the treatment they've had at the hands of this UK government. And the UK government claims it spends 50 billion per year in uh, welfare for disabled people. Um, however, this figure is uh, uh, hotly disputed, the, the view being that it's 37 billion. Now, of course, there are a range of rights uh, that uh, we could um, talk about and should talk about. Access to justice has been alluded uh, uh, by Pauline McNeill there. And the, the recent Supreme Court ruling um, on the case brought by Unison about uh, fees for employment tribunals is a very, very good example of, of where the, the, the law has is found in favour. Uh, mentions made of the Civil Litigation Bill, and, uh, which has taken forward the Sheriff Principal Taylor's review. And the, the phrase David versus Goliath is, is often mentioned. Well, as has been said, who was going to pay uh, the sums of money uh, to the employment tribunal to recuse some of the issues there. So there are environmental rights. The Scottish Government is fou still found to be lacking in respect of the Art House Convention. Indeed, was only reprimanded in recent days in Paris about that. And protective expenses orders aren't, uh, are, are insufficient for that. I'll close at that point. Thank you. I now call Mike Rumbles to speak to and move Amendment 7740.2. I move the amendment in my name. Deputy Presiding Officer, we've heard already there's been some significant progress made in recent times in this parliament when it comes to human rights for all. Years of campaigning by the Liberal Democrats and others paid off when the SNP government finally announced earlier this month that it would increase the age of criminal responsibility. That means we will now meet the minimum standard set down by the United Nations. The government should have answered our calls years ago, but at least they have finally caught up. Likewise, after Liberal Democrat campaigning, we now have properly regulated police stop and search procedures. Recently, the Scottish Government has said it will no longer oppose giving children equal protection from assault. This is a very welcome change. And whilst there is a long way to go, there has been much progress in Scotland when it comes to inclusivity and welcoming diversity. However, our celebration of the progress we've made should not distract from the work we still need to do and the areas that have been so far neglected. The government seems to have something of a pick and mix approach to human rights, shouting loudly about any successes and falling silent where there is inaction. The fact is that Scotland continues to fall short of international human rights standards. That's the findings by respected bodies, including the Scottish Human Rights Commission. Their most recent report concluded that, and I quote, the Scottish government has been vocal in its support for putting human rights at the heart of government and opposing the repeal of the Human Rights Act. Nevertheless, significant human rights challenges continue to be felt in people's day-to-day -day lives in areas like poverty, health, education, social care, disability, and detention, unquote. 
There is a wide range of areas in Scotland where human rights, needs, rights need to be significantly improved. These are complicated challenges, often interlinked, but we shouldn't shy away from the task for fear of criticism in the newspapers or from anywhere else. I will take a quick intervention, yeah. Elaine Smith. I thank the member very much for that intervention. And on that point, I wonder if the member could comment on um, the issue of non-discrimination based on religious belief, whether that should be upheld so that, for example, practising Catholics can have a right to bear witness to their faith in a country that seems to be becoming increasingly intolerant to religious belief. Mike Rumbles. I, I would agree. We need to be tolerant. I, I'm not even sure I like the word tolerant because it seems to be... So I don't know what it, I'm not quite happy with the word tolerant. We need to be all encompassing and we need to be sure that we treat everybody with respect and we make, and the point that you make is a fair one. To continue though, um, I said unfortunately, like nearly all challenges facing this parliament, these problems are exacerbated by the uncertainty, cost and impact of the impending exit from the European Union. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organizations surveyed their members, of which 80% felt that leaving the European Union would negatively impact human rights and equality. Slightly more believe Brexit will also worsen poverty and social exclusion. While the nature of what a potential Brexit will look like remains to be seen, there's plenty the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government could do right now to improve rights for our citizens. In particular, the blanket ban on prisoner voting and the inadequacy of mental health services continue to tarnish Scotland's reputation as a leader in human rights and equality. I urge the Scottish Government to rectify these immediately and ensure international human rights agreements and our legal obligations are actually enacted here in Scotland. Put simply, the blanket ban on prisoner voting is indefensible. It flouts international law and is neither fair nor progressive. Outside of these islands, no other Western European democracy does it. I've only, I'm in my last minute, unfortunately, otherwise I would. The Scottish Parliament has the power to deliver change, but thus far has ignored repeated calls, both domestically and internationally. The Liberal Democrats tabled amendments to give some prisoners the right to vote in both the independence referendum and the 2016 elections, but our attempts were voted down here in this chamber, and I think that was shameful. We know that to reduce re-offending, more must be done to prepare offenders to rejoin our communities. An important part of that is ensuring that they are more aware of their responsibilities as citizens, not alienating them altogether. Deputy Presiding Officer, there is so much more we need to do to ensure everyone has the chance to get on in life, from delivering a step change in mental health treatment, to changing the law to ensure children have equal protection from assault, and ensuring we accept the legal requirement to end the blanket ban on prisoner voting. We don't just need fine words from the Scottish Government. We need action, and we need action this day. I now call Adam Tompkins. Five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I think if uh, Mr Rumbles isn't sure about toleration, he should probably go and read some John Locke. I mean, if even the Liberals in this Parliament aren't sure about toleration, then we're really, we're really in trouble. But it isn't a blanket ban on prisoners voting. It's a ban on prisoners who are convicted of criminal offences, who are serving terms of imprisonment uh, in, in jail. It is not a ban on uh, prisoners on remand, and it is not a ban that extends after prisoners are released from prison. So it isn't a blanket ban. Um, presiding officer, I um, uh, will support the uh, government's motion today and indeed the Labour Party's amendment to it, but not the Liberal Democrat or the Green Party amendments. But I would say, even though we support the Scottish Government's motion today, that no nation, not even Scotland, can afford to be overly self-congratulatory about its human rights record. In Scotland, there are welcome measures, and the Cabinet Secretary alluded to a number of them in her remarks earlier this afternoon. But there are also, presiding officer, serious and significant flaws in the Scottish Government's human rights record, and Mr Rumbles just referred to a few of them. The Offensive Behaviour at Football Act, with its bizarre and incoherent restrictions on aspects of free speech. The named persons legislation, unanimously held by the Supreme Court only a year ago to be a disproportionate interference with the fundamental human right of 
um, uh, protection for families. And the bill that we've seen introduced uh, in the last few months to rectify that legislation uh, doesn't go anything like far enough as lawyer after lawyer after lawyer has pointed out uh, to the Education and uh, Skills Committee. On inequalities, presiding officer, one of Angela Constance's legacies as a former education secretary is the dismal fact that in the 30% most deprived communities in Scotland, only 54% of primary seven school children perform well in numeracy and only 56% in writing. Half of our primary school leavers in the most deprived communities in Scotland cannot write to the required standard and cannot count properly. That is not a human rights record to be proud of. And when we turn from educational inequalities to, the, to health, the picture, presiding officer, is just as stark. Scotland has the widest mortality inequality anywhere in Western Europe. Suicide rates, cancer survival rates, stroke mortality, alcohol-related deaths, teenage pregnancy, childhood obesity. In all of these areas of health and well-being, presiding officer, Scotland suffers from severe health inequalities. And it is, to my mind, a damning indictment of 20 years of devolution that under both Labour and Nationalist administrations, more has not been done to address and confront this problem. Ruth Maguire. I thank um, Adam Tompkins for taking an intervention. I wonder if he would tell the Chamber what his reaction is to a UN committee commenting that his party's policies were a human catastrophe mm -hmm. for disabled people. Adam Tompkins. Uh, I don't think it is a human catastrophe for disabled people that there are now 600,000 disabled people in Britain in work who weren't in Britain uh, when David Cameron became Prime Minister in 2010. I don't think it's a human catastrophe that the United Kingdom government spends £50 billion supporting disabled people in our economy. I don't think it's a human catastrophe when the United Kingdom, through its groundbreaking Disability Discrimination Act, passed under a Conservative government led by John Major in 1995, on which the UN Convention is largely based, was one of the world's first and is still one of the world's leading anti-discrimination pieces of legislation, no, uh, 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 discrimination legislation in, uh, with regard to disability. I don't think any of those things are human catastrophes, but as usual, Ruth Maguire wants to talk Britain down. Now, <laughs> presiding officer, let me turn to the Social Security Committee. Let me turn to the Social Security Bill, excuse me, which the Cabinet Secretary referred to in, in her opening. Now, we all know that the bill seeks to place devolved Social Security on a human rights footing with dignity, fairness and respect at its heart. Tremendous. But among our human rights, presiding officer, is the right to effective legal protection, the right to effective judicial protection. That's enshrined in Article 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights, and it's also right at the heart of EU law. So what are we to make of the evidence which the Social Security Committee has already received in its Stage 1 inquiry into the Social Security Bill from a variety of sources that shows that the Scottish Government is seeking to walk the walk with regard, or let's put it the other way around, the Scottish Government is seeking to talk the talk um, of uh, Social Security as a human right, but not walk the walk. Professor Tom Mullen, my colleague at the University of Glasgow Law School, says, for example, that it's difficult to work out the government's intention. If the legal status of the charter in particular is not clarified, citizens and their advisers may be unsure what their rights are. And Inclusion Scotland add, it appears that the charter is planned not to be about rights, but instead to be about service delivery. So let's hear a little bit more detail, perhaps, from the minister as he winds up about exactly how the rights of social security that the bill is seeking to enshrine can be judicially enforced in comp in, uh, compatibly with Article 13 of the ECHR. Otherwise, it's not really a human rights-based approach to social security at all, is it? Thank you, presiding officer. We now move on to the open speeches. Uh, the majority of the opening speakers took more time than they should have, so it may be um, that people will have to cut down their speeches towards the end of the list. And I first of all call Sandra White, to be followed by Annie Wells. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. If I could just reply to one of the areas that Professor Tompkins or Adam Tompkins raised about suicide. As a member of uh, the Social Security Committee, you were there when evidence was given, uh, Black Triangle, that people have committed suicide because of what's happened to the cuts in their benefits. So you were at that committee meeting and uh, I'm sure you'll take that on board. Presiding officer, a cornerstone of the Scottish Government's approach to Social Security is the principle that it is a human right 
as identified by the UN, helping to eradicate the stigma associated with accessing benefits. Now, our system will be the very first in the UK to reflect the UN principle that such, such systems should be established under national law and ensure the right of individuals and organisations to seek, receive and impart information on all social security entitlements in a clear and transparent way. And I think that's something this parliament should be proud of. Now, earlier on, the minister announced in regards to the creation of an agency in both Dundee and Glasgow and the opportunity that that will bring. And I do thank uh, the minister for that and particularly answering my questions in regarding staff that should reflect the diversity of our communities. I think that's a very important issue that we should take on board also. Now, this government, uh, and I, see, I sincerely believe this, this, this government, but I do sincerely believe this, that members of this parliament, regardless of what political party they are, want to create an, a system here which is effective and based on dignity and respect. What we don't want to see is to stigmatise those accessing the social security system. This is something which has been highlighted on many occasions, not least by the Welfare Conditionality Project based at Glasgow University and in collaboration with various other institutions. Now, it's almost a year <clears throat> since I highlighted their research in this very chamber and the situation hasn't changed much. And I want the, the Tories and the opposition benches to perhaps even listen to this and take that back to, to whoever they want to take it back to in the UK Parliament. Now, what's happened is the situation hasn't changed much. UK government are continuing to punish those most in need, whilst their backbenchers in Westminster described the rise in food banks' use as uplifting. uplifting. Now, she described this kind of situation in this way only reinforces to me and many others how completely and utterly out of touch the Tories are with the reality of their ideological policies and the effect it has on the people who are on the receiving end of these policies. <clears throat> now, researchers looked at two main areas, how effective condition conditionality is in changing the behaviour of those receiving welfare benefits and also services and any particular circumstances in which the use of conditionality may or not be justifiable. The findings were and remain a stark reminder of the complete and utter failure of the Tory government to provide meaningful support to those who need it. And I know that I've got to conclude shortly, presiding officer, much more to say, but what I want to conclude with, presiding officers, it really boils down to what kind of society we want to live in one where we protect and support those which they need it and when they need it, or one where we actively work to demonise those in need. Now, I'll always opt, and I'm sure others will too, for a society where we protect, support and nurture with a commitment to respecting and implementing human rights. That is the way forward and that's what's going to happen in this parliament. I'm sure, as I said before, all members in this parliament, whatever party, will support that absolute basic right. But I would like to hear it confirmed, particularly from the opposition benches and the Tory party, that they will actually stand up for the people most in need. And that's the people being most hurt by the UK benefit system at the moment. Thank you very much, Mr. Officer. Thank you very much. And I, I say to members, regrettably, it has to be a strict four minutes. There is no time in, in hand. I call Annie Wells, who followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Upon seeing the Cabinet Secretary's motion, I was of course aware of the breadth of topics that would be brought to the debate today. Of course, underpinning this and intrinsic to any government policy, dignity, equality and human rights should be at the centre of our thinking. That is why I will be supporting the government's motion today and I too welcome the appointment of Professor Alan Miller as the chair of the new expert group seeking to enhance human rights in Scotland. We have recently celebrated 20 years of devolution and the Scottish Parliament is rightly recognised as a pillar of everyday life in Scotland. Taking decisions that can help build a fairer Scotland and I am sure all of us in this chamber want to see that. I want to see constructive debate when it comes to discussing issues such as social security, the rights of children and human rights more generally. I want to see at least recognition from the Scottish Government that it has had 10 years of governing over fully devolved areas such as health and education, pillars of people's everyday lives which are so fundamental in bringing about equality.
getting back to basics. Just this weekend, analysis by Professor Jim Gallagher, an expert in Nuffield College, Oxford, found that spending on schools and health were two of the public sector areas who have lost out most since the SNP came to power a decade ago. The First Minister has said not once but twice made education her priority, and yet we have not seen any narrow narrowing of the attainment gap. In science, maths and reading, Scotland's poorer children are nearly three, time, three years behind children from affluent backgrounds. And by the time Scotland's children have reached university age, just 10% of the poorest 20% of Scots go to university, compared to 18% in England and 16 in Wales and Northern Ireland. When it comes to health, we see that Scotland has some of the highest mortality rates in Western Europe. In my own region, Glasgow, discrepancies in life expectancies of people in different areas of the city are truly shocking. Whilst in areas such as Georgian Hill, Hindland and Partick, men and women can expect to live on average until 70 and 84 respectively, in areas southeast of the city, these figures drop to 64 and 72. Looking across Scotland, we see vast gaps between those living in the most and least deprived parts of the country when it comes to the health fundamentals. If you're a child living in a deprived area, you're twice as likely to, to be obese. If you're a teenager, you're five times more likely to get pregnant. And if you live in a deprived area, you're 42% more likely to die of a stroke and six times more likely to die from alcohol-related issues. The members in the last, last minute. minute sorry. These are absolute fundamentals to tackling inequality in Scotland. As I've said, they are pillars of people's everyday lives, which are so fundamental in creating a level playing field for everyone in Scotland. To finish the day, presiding officer, I would like to again reiterate my support for the government's motion. No one would deny the promotion of human rights for all has become intrinsic to our values as a country. And this is a concern shared across our parties. That's why it's absolutely vital that the Scottish Government do recognise that they have the economic and social levers at their disposal to do this and we can have a constructive debate on all sides in this Parliament. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Christina McKelvey, followed by Mary Fee. Ms McKelvey, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Um, human rights are just fundamental to each and everyone's existence. There can be absolutely no question of diluting them. But before I go into the substantive part of my speech, maybe I should alert Mr Rumbles and Mr Tompkins to the work of the Equality and Human Rights Committee on prisoner voting rights, and I'd welcome any contributions that they would like to make to that. This Parliament's taken some action on that. That's why this, this motion is very important, presiding officer. It's absolutely intrinsic to our strongly held views, views of equality, justice, dignity and respect, and we need to lock these down permanently. Clearly the same does not apply for Theresa May's government. And maybe Mr Tompkins can find out for his pals at the UK government why the Justice and Home Affairs paper on Brexit makes no reference to Scots law if he's such a fan of Scots law. But make no mistake about it, our human rights are under threat, not only from the seen and unseen consequences of Brexit, but also from the internal politics of the Tory party. We've just heard some of it. This is a UK Conservative government that has twice, twice, once in 2010, once in 2015, in their manifestos, promised to scrap the Human Rights Act. So let's just repeat that. Not once, but twice pledged to scrap the Human Rights Act. And nothing more than a showpiece pandering all of branch to the right-wing factions. The same right-wing faction that forced the hand of David Cameron and brought forward an unwanted, unnecessary and damaging European Union referendum that Scots would now vote 71% in favour of remaining in the EU if there was a referendum today re reveals just how much the lies of the leavers impacted on votes in June last year. Reality is really biting now. Reality is setting in that our fundamental human rights are at risk as a result of Brexit. And if you can't see that, I'm sorry, but you must be blind to the effects of it. We have all have the right to life, we know that. We have the right to freedom from violence and degrading treatment, freedom from discrimination, freedom from fear and freedom from want. 
We want to have the right to have an adequate standard of a living, to have a safe home to support good physical and mental health. Presiding officer, this Scottish Government has given explicit pledges that in a 10-year mental health strategy, a welcome and progressive step showing Scotland is leading the way on human rights. But I've seen, when I was on the Social Security Committee, I've seen from people like Black Triangle, I've seen from people who come to my constituency surgeries, the effect that the welfare reforms are having on them. We also, presiding officer, have the right to self-determination. And I would like to pledge my support in this chamber, and I hope many of my colleagues would do, to the Catalan people for their right to self-determination in a free from interference referendum. Presiding officer, we also need to lead the way in clamping down harder. We've clamped down on human trafficking, on criminalising revenge porn, on recognising the rights of the LGBTI community and on protecting refugees, especially the ones who are fleeing from persecution. But we have people in this country fleeing from persecution, fleeing from Tory persecution. The rights of all, including the rights of those persons with a disability, something, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to shy away from saying this, and it should be said over and over and over again. The UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disability has laid it out plain. Not only has there been a grave and systematic violation of human rights of people with disabilities, but it is now a human catastrophe. Presiding officer, the European referendum regrettably shone a light into some dark corners. It showed us some inequalities, it showed poverty, it showed exclusion, it showed discrimination and it gave us a rise in xenophobia. In Scotland, we reject those attitudes. In Scotland, we have proven our will, not by words, but by actions. We will lead where others will follow and we will act where others won't, including the UK government. And I, along with this Scottish government, will defend and promote our human rights, underpinned by our determined and long-held values of respect, dignity and equality for all. Maybe the Tories in this chamber should try it. Thank you very much. I call Mary Fee to be followed by George Adam. Ms Fee, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate and I thank the Scottish Government for bringing these important issues to the Chamber to discuss. Dignity, equality and human rights for all should be at the heart of all democratically elected governments and parliaments across the world. And unfortunately, in too many parts of the world, it is not. To me, dignity, equality and human rights for all is much, much more than the title of a motion. It's what drives me in my politics and when fighting for my constituents. Our human rights have been fought and won over many years, and to make any attempt to strip them back would be an affront to our standing in the world and an assault on our shared decency. I cannot take comfort in the idea of the Tories replacing the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights. The thought of a Tory government meddling with basic rights is horrendous, and we as a parliament must use our strength to resist any attempt to repeal the Human Rights Act. On issues such as LGBT rights, our parliament has been a shining light over the last 20 years. From repealing section 28 to the introduction of equal marriage, we have always sought and will continue to seek to do the right thing. On disability rights, we have united in opposition to shameful actions imposed by the Tories from welfare cuts that withdraw the basic needs of disabled people to supported employment being stripped away. We have made our voice clear that people with disabilities deserve much better. And recently, the UN Committee on the Rights of Person with, Persons with Disabilities has expressed its dissatisfaction with the Tory government over their treatment of some of our most vulnerable members of society. And in assessing the welfare cuts imposed on disabled people, the CRPD has previously said that the welfare reforms led to grave and systematic violations of disabled people's rights. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm not prepared to do that. Presiding officer, the motion today asks for Parliament to support to embed a human rights approach in our public services. Our amendment adds to that in calling for human rights to be viewed as a broad-based principle encompassing workers' rights. This is the right path to take, and my discussions with equality, disability, and human rights groups also informs me that the government's approach is the right one. During the summer recess, I met with the Ash Project in Glasgow, who help asylum seekers with their accommodation rights. And I was appalled to learn of the treatment that many of them face, not from the community that they reside in, 
but from the organisation that is contracted to accommodate and support them. And if we are serious about embedding a human rights approach into public services, we must call on the UK Home Office to respect that decision and treat people fleeing persecution, war and terror with much more respect and provide the rights that we expect for ourselves. And presiding officer, I thank the Scottish Government for bringing this debate today. And I also welcome the statements made by the First Minister during the programme for government on protecting our human rights and guaranteeing them for all of those who live in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call George Adam to follow by Michelle Ballantyne. Mr Adam, please. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to talk about, take this time to talk about the quality of life and the rights of those living with a disability and their families. And I would also take this point to actually explain to some of the members on the Conservative benches, particularly Adam Tompkins, when we're having this discussion, please let's be very careful with the language that we use. You know, to use an analogy like walk the walk, when you're talking about people living with a disability, is extremely offensive and is a typical example of why Tories are as toxic as they currently are. Because from my time as a councillor in Renfrewshire, I've worked with these disability groups. Yes, quite gladly. Mr Tompkins. Will you make the same point to Christina McKelvey about describing me as blind because I can't see something? Exactly. Yeah. George Ms McKelvey was actually explaining that you could not see that this was wrong, what you're doing. In fact, I would ask you and your colleagues to stand up and actually defend the position and say you're wrong here in this position. Your position is you used language that was totally unacceptable during this debate. But that's nothing unusual with the Conservative Party. Because whether I, I'm working with the Renfrewshire Access Panel, uh, which I was a council's representative and now I'm a member of it, or whether it's the Scottish Disabled Supporters Association, I've worked with people with their disabilities and I've worked and heard their stories and their struggle. And never have these stories been more vivid and more scary than when it's been talked about that people with disabilities have had to contend with Tory welfare reform, which is nothing more than attack on our most vulnerable within society, gladly, Mr. Balfour. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Thank you to uh, Mr. Adams for taking uh, uh, the intervention. Would you recognise that we do have to be careful with our language? And when we talk about disabled people, that is lots of individuals who have had lots of different experiences. So, for example, the lady I talked to on Saturday who wasn't entitled to do L DLA because of the PIP, is now entitled. So we have to be careful that we don't put everybody in one group, but talk about individuals. Yes. I'll uh, give you some extra time for taking two I interventions, I really don't Mr. need Adam. to listen to Mr. Balfour with that, as my wife has multiple sclerosis, which is an invisible disability for many when they don't, their disability isn't showing. So as one, I will take no lectures from a Tory on language and how we actually talk about people with disability. I, for one, am working with a family that are living with that since she was diagnosed at 16 years old. So when we talk about the Tories, we only have to look at some of the situations that people have gotten themselves into at this stage, where they come to our committee and we hear from Black Triangle that people have got so desperate because of Tory reforms that they have talked about taking their own life. And in many cases, some have. We had a Tory uh, government uh, minister come to us and actually say he thought that wasn't, that wasn't the issue and he knew people that had multiple sclerosis. Obviously, he'd been briefed that my wife had it as well. But the whole point with this is the Tory in Westminster have got this totally wrong. I would obviously give all other opportunities for the opposition to come in if I thought for one minute one of them would actually stand up and say that this is wrong. But, presiding officer, the, the wee Westminster Tory drones are not going to do any of that because for too long disabled people have had to deal with a DWP who have talked to them at them and not listened to them, all because they believe that this is the reform and the way that we must go forward. We only have to look at the way that people who have been going through the DLA PIP migration and how they have been uh, made sure that they've lost their cars, they've lost the amounts of money that they've had. This has been an absolute unmitigated disaster since the very moment of its inception and one that has actually caused people with disabilities in Scotland absolute heartache and financial hardships. And when we talk about the UN that they stated that the Tories have created a human catastrophe, 
a human catastrophe, presiding officer. You know, I get involved in politics for a number of reasons. One was to protect my, uh, uh, my community from Tory excesses. Well, some things never changed from the 1980s, they're still the same. And the other was to build the type of future that I want my children and my grandchildren to live in. I'll keep working towards that future. I only hope that the Tories and other members in this chamber will join me and build that future. Thank you. I call Michelle Ballantyne to fall by Claire Adamson. Ms Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a newcomer to this chamber and these debates, I would like to begin by drawing upon the words of Bruce Crawford, who said in this chamber back in March of this year that members have a special responsibility and a public duty to show leadership and to show respect to each other in how we conduct debate. He also that day quoted the head of the Scottish Consortium for Learning Disability when he noted that if we characterise our opponents as divisive, we will divide. If we use the language of hate, we will create bitterness. This intervention drew applause from this chamber, and rightly so. His words, of course, were in the context of the debate on Scotland's choice, but they are just as appropriate and just as resonant in today's debate, and indeed in every debate we have in this chamber. Unfortunately, when I sat in on last week's debate on housing, I feared that Bruce Crawford's eloquence had not gained traction with some of his colleagues, and again I hear it today. Last week we heard expletives, we heard accusations of false motives, and worst of all, we heard assumptions of ignorance and contempt for those in greatest need based purely on where a member sits in this chamber. I truly hoped that this debate would not be visited by such conduct. It reflects negatively on all members, all political parties, on in this place as an institution of democracy. Now, it's in that spirit of positive engagement that we on this Scottish Conservative benches actually support this motion. Of course we are committed to creating a fairer Scotland underpinned by respect for human rights. Of course we want to protect, promote and implement human rights and equality of, of all across Scotland. And of course we are proud of the strides Scotland has made in entrenching the rights set out in international treaties into law. Nevertheless, it is the most vital role of the opposition to hold this government to account whenever necessary. And as my colleague Annie Wells has said, this government must do better in its approach to tackling inequality. When it comes to health, my colleague Professor Tompkins has already indicated that Scotland continues to have the widest mortality inequalities in Western Europe, with cancer and stroke mortality rates and alcohol-related deaths significantly higher than the most deprived areas. Yes? Mr Finney. Thank you. I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. I wonder if the member would like to express her view as to what impact someone being sanctioned and being unable to heat their house or have um, fuel to cook with has on health expectations. Ms Ballantyne. It doesn't help. Um, that's the bottom line. And the whole point of it is that actually when sanctions were brought in, it was to ensure that people were doing what they were expected to do within the remits of the benefits that they got. It is not. None of this is about trying to harm people. It's about people stepping up to the responsibilities they have. But we can't look Members at in our rights. closing remarks. We can't look at rights in isolation, and this is the whole point of this. We need to see equal emphasis on the parallel responsibilities that accompany such rights. And to ignore that balance will not produce a generous, inclusive, trusting society. But I don't draw, draw attention to these issues for the purpose of political point scoring, but rather to say that we should ignite a productive debate about the path we should be taking. And it comes from a desire for cooperation and getting the right path, not condemnation. Presiding officer, whilst we in this chamber might differ in our approach to achieving and safeguarding equality, dignity and human rights, we do stand united behind our belief on these principles. The common ground between us is vast and yet too often disregarded by those on the Scottish Government benches. On issues of such fundamental importance as equality and human rights, let us disagree humbly, debate constructively, and work tirelessly towards a better, more equal Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Call Claire Adamson, followed by James Dornan. And Mr Dornan will be the last speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, one of my favourite historical novels um, was 
written by the acclaimed Scottish author James Robertson, and it's about the case of Joseph Knight, a real case um, from 1777. Joseph Knight sought the freedom to leave the employment of John Wedderburn of Ballandine and claimed his pleadings that the very act of landing in Scotland freed him of perpetual servitude as slavery was not recognised in Scotland. He'd been brought to Scotland many years earlier as a slave bought in Jamaica. Knight feared at the time that um, Weatherbird wished to take him back to Jamaica to sell him as a slave in the colonies. In defence of his position, um, he also argued that in Scots law, Knight, even though he was not recognised as a slave in Scotland, was still bound to provide perpetual service in the same manner as an indentured servant or apprenticed artisan. In the ruling, the Court of Session said the dominion assumed over Joseph Knight under the law of J Jamaica being unjust would not be supported in this country to any extent. The defender had no right to Joseph Knight's service in any space of time, nor to send him out of the country against his consent. Essentially, Knight succeeded in arguing that he should be allowed to leave domestic service, provide a home for his wife and child. And in doing so, he gave the Court of Session in Scotland the opportunity to declare that slavery was not recognised by Scots law and that runaway slaves could seek protection from the court, courts if they wished to leave domestic service. A wonderful judgment that changed Scotland in 1777, and yet it seems so long ago today. To make it absolutely clear, I make no comparison with slavery of the past. Indeed, the appropriation of that history would be entirely inappropriate as there are no comparisons to the excesses and the misuses and injustices of that time. However, I do think the rights won by Joseph Knight in this country have parallels today. It touches on so many of the injustices on modern Britain. The fears of EU and other nationals who have chosen to make Scotland their home and no longer are securing their status. Joseph Knight established the right to live work fairly in Scotland, reflecting so many of the fair work um, pledges made by the Scottish Government going forward for a fairer Scotland and mentioned by the Labour motion and by Paul McNeill earlier today. I feel that many people facing the rules under universal credit, when sanctions could be levelled against those refusing to take on a zero hours contract, those people would have something to say about perpetual service and endangered servitude. As with those in Scotland today who are at the will of human trafficking and modern day slavery. And those seeking asylum would only look on envy that Joseph Knight could not be returned to a country where the law was deemed to be unjust by Scotland. This government is taking leadership in the area of human rights and equality. We cannot let the rights we have be diminished at all going forward. And is it incumbent on all of us to work towards a Scotland that is fairer and recognises the human rights of all? I welcome the appointment of Professor Alan Miller and I look forward to working with those across the chambers who hold human rights and equality at the core of what they do here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Dorn and then we move to closing speeches. Mr Dorn. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, to start with the body of my speech, I'd just like to comment on a couple of things that have been said by our Conservative comrades, which is not a phrase you would use very often about them, but the... We hear, I'm delighted that they're supporting the motion, the government's motion. I think that's something that we should all take some comfort from. But it's difficult to take it seriously when every single one of them uses a speech to deflect attention from the government with 85% of the welfare powers that could make this a much more equal society. We've got Adam Tompkins with his desperate attempt to deflect by bringing in the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act. We've got uh, education and health. It seems it's okay to talk about them, but let's not talk about welfare or sanctions or immigration. Let's make them taboo subject because this government doesn't, this parliament doesn't have control over them. 
but we still have people that we're responsible for who are suffering for the actions of the government that you represent in this parliament and you point blank refuse to mention them in any of your contributions. Now, I'm going to start with a quote which is a very unusual, from a very unusual source from me. For me, it's a, a quote by Winston Churchill. And I could make, give you many quotes of Winston Churchill that I would be very unhappy to use, but this one he gave in a speech at the University of Zurich on the 19th of September 1946, where he urged the nations to form a United States of Europe to dwell in peace, safety and freedom together. Churchill's speech 71 years ago today marked the beginning of the Council of Europe a monumental project which still rightly describes itself as being the leading human rights organisation on our continent. Throughout many of the speeches, the Council of Europe's greatest achievements, the European Convention on Human Rights has been commended, but, uh, and most of the members, I think, would agree it's still as vital today as it was when drafted by the Council in 1950. It's enshrined in the Scotland Act 1998. It's fundamental in safeguarding our human rights. However, it's now under severe threat from the Tory government at Westminster. And the Conservative general election manifesto, they only committed to remain a member of the ECHR for the lifetime of the current parliament. This convention has been absolutely instrumental in safeguarding our human rights, and it's for that reason that the SNP manifesto reaffirmed our commitment to the Council of Europe, the ECHR, and their institutions. Thanks to the ECHR, victims of domestic violence have been able to get better protection, LGBTI people have used human rights to overcome discrimination, and as we've seen with regard to the bedroom tax, disabled people can fight against cruel welfare reforms, yet the UK government won't commit to its long-term future. You know, as I say, I appreciate the support that we're getting from the, the Conservatives, but I do think it's telling that they haven't tabled an amendment today. I think they've conceded that their track record when it comes to human rights is both nothing short of symbolic and almost impossible to defend. On the other hand, I would say the Scottish Government's record is one to be proud of. Their consistent application of the principles of quality, dignity and respect ensures that fundamental human rights are guaranteed for every member of Scottish society. Against the backdrop of Brexit, the Scottish Government will ensure existing and future human rights protections provided under EU law are maintained and we will not allow the Tories to undermine human rights as they drive us off the Brexit cliff. The Tories and their austerity econ economics, their abolition of the Independent Living Fund, the cutting of the employability programmes and the reforms to the welfare state, as, every, as others have said earlier, caused the UN last year to accuse them of grave or systematic violations of the UN conventions on the rights of the persons with disabilities. And Adam Tompkins said, UN's got it wrong. Just like the Tory government down south have says, the EU's got it wrong. It's only us that know better. Not the people who suffer from the actions you take, but you know best. But this is why in our programme for government, we have, for example, committed to work, working further with the fantastic TAI, Time for Inclusive Education campaign, who are at Parliament today, who are campaigning to combat homophobia, biphobia and transphobia with inclusive education. And the Scottish Government's great work in upholding the rights of the disabled, of children, of women, uh, LGBTI community is only the tip of the iceberg. And we'll continue to do this great work across the whole of our society, whilst the Tories try our hardest to drag us back to Victorian times. Thank, Thank you, you very much. I call on Mike Rumbles to close the Liberal Democrats. Five minutes, please, Mr Rumbles. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I was surprised by the fact that, unlike all the other opposition parties, the Conservative Party did not feel it necessary to lodge an amendment to the Scottish Government's motion today. Perhaps they felt that they didn't have anything specific to add to it, but that, of course, is entirely up to them. Um, despite some of his comments, I welcome Adam Tompkins' contribution to the debate today, uh, and I acknowledge his expertise in the field. So it is more puzzling, given that expertise, that there is no Conservative amendment before us to debate, but, but there you are. Uh, OK, yes. Mr Tompkins. Conservative amendment to the motion because we agree with the motion and we'll vote for it at decision time. Mr Indeed. Rumbles. I, I took that as a given, but I just was saying that I, I thought that it was odd that the Conservatives had nothing to add to the motion, as all the other opposition parties have done. Uh, I have to say, referring to Adam Tompkins, that... Um, his comments that there is no blanket ban on giving the vote to prisoners is bizarre. Or some would say the professor may be dancing on the head of a pin. He said that since those remanded by our authorities had the vote, and those released from prison had the vote, there is no such blanket ban. I'm laughing because it's obvious, isn't it? The fact that short-term prisoners sentenced and serving time in prison do face a blanket ban on their right to vote. This position 
is quite indefensible if we are concerned about effectively reintegrating prisoners into society when they are released. I said earlier on in an intervention from Elaine Smith that personally I'm not convinced that the use of the word tolerant is the best one to use in the context of human rights. I, should we simply be tolerating? Is it not better to use a different word? I always think of tolerating as putting up with. Uh, I don't want to put up with uh, everyone's human rights. I want to support them and celebrate those rights. Well, indeed, I hope you are tolerating me now. I would expect that from the Conservative benches. I'd like to now to turn to Labour's amendment, focusing, as it does, on improving the rights of disabled people in areas of education, employment, and public transport. Of course, all these things are interlinked. If I could just use one example to highlight this from my region in the Northeast, at Inch Railway Station, there is no disabled access to the northbound platform. It affects people's ability to access employment, education, and their ability to socialize. Yesterday, Nest Trans unanimously agreed to fund a 25,000 pound feasibility study to change the situation because it isn't part of the program for the Aberdeen to Inverness Railway. I have also met Humza Youssef, the transport minister, who is also fully supportive of this initiative. Councillor Peter Argyle, the chair of Nestran, said yesterday, it's not acceptable to have a station in the 21st century where a substantial amount of the population find it difficult to access. I couldn't agree more. Improving the rights of disabled people, especially on our public transport, is essential. And I'm confident that in my region, this is just one example of addressing the human rights of disabled people. I'm conscious of time, Deputy Presiding Officer, so in conclusion, all I would say is that the Liberal Democrats will at decision time support the government's motion and we will support the other amendments. It's interesting that I would like to have said I would support a Conservative amendment, but since there isn't one and they decided not to put one forward, um, I'm just questioning whether that was the wisest thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I call John Finney, close for the Greens, please. Five minutes, Mr Finney. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, and uh, our particular amendment covered the issue of the, the report by the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. So I, I make no apology for uh, returning to that um, and again saying that the committee singled out that impact assessments conducted by the state foresaw an adverse impact on disabled people, yet policies were still implemented. That's not a neglectful decision, that's a conscious decision in the face of evidence. And, and how's that manifested itself? And, and I should have in my opening address thanked the, the various people who have been in touch with the information as ever briefings. Here's one comment. Between 2011 and 2014, 2,380 people died shortly after being found fit for work. Their final days will have been marred by the stress and indignity imposed by the UK government's policy on disability benefits, in this case, employment and support allowance. And then sometimes I think it's, it's helpful to, to, to put a particular uh, face on that. And one of the examples given is a former soldier. And uh, we would understand that the UK government um, historically certainly would have been supportive of their armed services. This is a former soldier who died from a lack of insulin after being unable to keep his insulin at the correct cool temperature following being sanctioned and having his electricity cut off. I think, uh, and I apologise for the, 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 the detail, but I think it's important to say that a post-mortem found his stomach was also empty. So these are, the, these are the real manifestations of when you assess something and then you disregard it. And may well, it's, it's quite appropriate that the Tories all have their heads down at this point. I'm very happy to take an intervention if anyone would want to justify that situation. Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on, uh, there, there's a number of issues that uh, um, re require to be addressed, and in fact, they're in front of me rather than below me, and they are uh, the issues like age of criminal responsibility. I think it's welcome, and I think it's churlish to, to be involved in a profession which is about persuading folk to change their mind and then being um, disrespectful to them when they do that. So I welcome the fact that the Scottish Government have taken the position in respect of age of criminal responsibility, a thing that many, many people campaign for. And also, <clears throat> on a very personal level, I welcome the support for the legislation and equal protection. Yes, outside bodies have suggested that's the, the, the right thing to do, but let's do it because we want to do it. And I think that is the ge general direction of travel. <coughs> Don't always agree with my colleague, Mike Rumbles, entirely agree with him in relation to the 
prisoners' voting rights, and I think in the last session it was uh, a, a relatively small group when we were looking at the issues around the referendum that did lend their support to that. And I would entirely agree with his view. People who are on the Justice Committee will be familiar that one of the elements, and indeed beyond, that one of the elements is of um, putting people to prison is, is an element of punishment. That's very clear. But it's also clear that the reason people are sent there is for rehabilitation. If we don't, therefore, encourage people to engage in external society, how are we going to progress that? I talked in the uh, opening speech about uh, access to justice and the issue of equality of the arms is one that's important. And that's why we need the fallback of uh, state intervention. So I, I first raised the issue of the Aarhus Convention in 2011, I think, in, in, in here. It's disappointing that it took to the final weeks of the last session before there was a consultation. I would hope the government would take a look at what's been said most recently about it, because I know there is a will to ensure that there isn't an issue around access to justice. And it's certainly my view and others that there is with this particular convention. And then it, what does that mean? Well, the implications are that those who have the necessary finance have impunity, and we don't want that. Um, I think there's an important role for equality impact assessments. Nothing's been said about gypsy travellers. There's been a lot said about gypsy travellers in recent times. I think it's the one area where I think we would all agree that people still feel they can say what they wish, um, when if you were to transfer that to uh, other categories, people wouldn't. There's a long way to go. There's been two very strongly worded reports from this parliament to government. And that, of course, applies to, to, to our, our Roma residents, too, who are, are very welcome here, or who I feel are welcome here, as are welcome fugitives from justice. James Dorland talked about Winston Churchill and the, the history of a lot of rights. This was about assisting people who are fleeing persecution, and that is a very laudable aim. I welcome Professor Miller's appointment, and uh, I wish him and his team well. Uh, I understand they will keep the Scottish Government to count. That is the role of the opposition, nasty party aside. I think there is a progressive consensus in this uh, chamber. We will be supporting the Labour Amendment. We'll be supporting the, the Lib Dem Amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr Finney. I call Mark Griffin to close for Labour. Mr Griffin, please, five minutes. Thank you, President Officer. The 1990 Act, the EU Charter and the European Convention underline the human rights protection that everyone in Scotland rightly deserves as citizens. Human rights are regularly portrayed as a negative, a problem caused by Europe. They've consistently been the focus of right-wing press mis misinformation since the 1990 Act was enacted by Labour. We're committed to standing up for people's rights. That's why we introduced the Human Rights Bill and why we've consistently pledged to fight any attempt to water down the protection that it brings. The 1998 Act brings home our rights, giving our most vulnerable citizens a, power mean, a powerful means of redress and protecting us all against the misuse of state power. And the European Convention on Human Rights was not imposed from abroad. It was drawn up by our lawyers, drawn on our philosophy to set international standards of respect for common humanity after the Second World War. Our voice in the world is not only a reflection of the size of our economy, but the moral leadership that we demonstrate on human rights. We must continue to urge others to respect the rule of law and freedoms and rights that every, be every human being is entitled to in Myanmar and everywhere else. We welcome the importance given to dignity, equality and human rights in the latest programme for government, including the commitment to a comprehensive audit of the most effective way to further embed the principles of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child into policy and legislation. The government are right to oppose any attempt by the UK government to undermine the Human Rights Act 1998 or withdraw from the European Convention on Human Rights and to commit to ensuring existing and relevant future human rights protections provided under EU law are maintained following UK withdrawal. But we do think that the Scottish Government should do more though. The Government's failure to include some key guarantees in the Social Security Bill, including a ban on private sector contractors and uprating payments in line with inflation, could see the commitment to dignity and respect undermined by future governments and provides no certainty that the new Scottish agency will be and will continue to be better than the DWP. Now, SNP speaker after speaker rightly criticised 
the Tory government for their treatment of disabled people. But they do seem to forget that full power over disability benefits still lies with Westminster because this government delayed full devolution of them until the end of the decade. Now, when 26% of people in poverty in Scotland are disabled, the second highest rate in the UK, it's wrong that the government willingly left powers over disability payments in the hands of the Tories, and that's something I would ask SNP speakers to reflect on. Now, the most recent Scottish Government hate crime statistics show an increase in both sexual orientation and trans transgender identity aggravated crime charges reported. Transgender identity aggravated crime charges were up a shocking 33% year on year. Earlier this month, Stonewall Scotland reported that 17% of LGBT respondents surveyed suffered abuse because of their sexuality, up from 9% in 2013. The report also found that almost half of trans people experienced a hate crime or incident because of their gender identity in the last 12 months. The government should publish a full breakdown of LGBTI hate crime statistics in Scotland so we can fully understand what's happening and prevent these attacks from continuing. Finally, presiding officer, the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People must be enshrined in law and significant progress should be made in the parliamentary term to improve the rights of disabled people in areas of education, employment and public transport. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Jamie Green to close the Conservatives' six minutes, please, Mr Green. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, the Scottish Conservative decided not to lodge an amendment today to the motion uh, because in principle there isn't anything to disagree with in the wording of the motion itself, uh, simply because when it comes to human rights and dignity, I'm sure most of us in this chamber are able to find consensus. I'd like to touch on some of the contributions made today because they've been quite wide and varied in the short time that we've had to speak and debate this. Uh, from my own benches, it's fair to say that we are committed to engaging quite constructively in these debates. Why? Because we want to help shape a better future for Scotland too. Which is why, listening to this debate, outside of this chamber, people will have noticed quite a substantive difference in the way that we approach the debate today compared to some of the other parties. We didn't amend the motion. We will vote with the government at decision time. We accept Labour's additional wisdom in this debate. We gave collaborative speeches. And I won't name names, but today we heard from a number of other members who took this as nothing more than another opportunity to pull the speech out of the folder called Tory bashing anti-Westminster that comes out week after week in this parliament every time we try to have a meaningful debate about something that matters to people in Scotland. My colleague Adam Tompkins opened his remarks today touching on some very important issues that there are already a number of inequalities in Scotland, in health, in education, in access to public services. Now, he's already pointed out a number of areas of legislation where this government has failed to meet its own human rights obligations. He talked about the Offensive Behaviour at Footballs Act. He talked about the Name Person Scheme, to name a few. So, the government benches can sit there and blame Westminster for the ills of the world when it has the ability itself and its policy and its legislation making and the bills that it puts before this parliament to make access to equality better in Scotland as it is. My colleague Annie Wells also spoke about some of those huge health inequalities that we experience in Scotland and that are experienced by our poorest communities. Uh, I'm very tight for time in this debate. I'm, I uh, you have some spare time if you wish. If I get extra time, I will. Thank you. Minister. Uh, th I'm grateful to the member for, for giving way. What does he think lies behind and drives those health inequalities and those social inequalities? Mr Green. Uh, uh, if we had another hour, we could talk about uh, equality in Scotland. In fact, we've debated it in this chamber on a number of occasions, and I believe actually I spoke in that debate uh, around some of the issues, uh, some of the long-standing issues that affect Scotland. And I'm very happy to have a, a meaningful uh, debate about the complex issue of poverty in Scotland. If he's happy to do so, we can do it after today's debate. 
Uh, I'd like to actually focus on one particular speech today that I think says a lot about how this parliament debates these issues, and that was from my colleague Michelle Ballantyne. I thought it was an excellent speech. And the reason why I thought it was an excellent speech is because she took the opportunity to say that we will work constructively with other parties and other members uh, in this parliament if we are able to respect each other's differing point of views. And that is something that many members in this chamber are absolutely incapable of doing. I think Michelle made a very good point about the tone in which we approach issues such as equality in this parliament. So thank you, Michelle Ballantyne, for that like contribution. It. No, I won't. I'd like to touch on some of the comments from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary made some very valid points. The Cabinet Secretary made some very valid points about some of the factors uh, that can help inequality in Scotland, such as economic growth. And I'm pleased to hear her mention sustainable economic growth, uh, tackling ill health, uh, access to education, and so on. A number of triggers that this Parliament already has and levers that this Parliament already has, yet there are no mention of them in the motion, and that is my only criticism of the Government's motion today. We're unable to support Mr Finney's amendment today, and we're unable to, uh, to support the Liberal amendment today too. Um, but that being said, I think Labour made a very valid contribution uh, around some of the uh, additional inequalities that disabled people have in Scotland, and it is absolutely right that we address them. Too often in this Parliament, we fall into the trap of saying that simply by talking about issues, we will resolve them. Our limited time in this place would be better served by debating and discussing how we can use the powers already at our disposal to tackle the challenges in Scotland. Uh, presiding officer, uh, in my closing seconds, um, I, I wish I had more time to talk about uh, some of the other contributions made, um, but I think some of them... You have really at least a minute. A minute, perfect. Okay, well, in that case, um, presiding officer, uh, I was pleased to uh, hear um, some of the contributions made by, for example, Claire Adamson, who I think gave a very um, meaningful and, uh, and thoughtful, I may not agree with everything she had to say politically, um, but I do really respect the approach that she took to the debate today, and I thank her. Uh, for that uh, contribution. In the spirit of being constructive, I would just like to close by asking the government and the front bench not to overlook the challenges that we do face in Scotland in health and education and to use the Parliament's powers that it already has to address some of these, to tackle these inequalities. I do urge the government to work constructively with other parties in this place to build a consensus around some of the key issues uh, that this debate was uh, uh, focusing on today. We want to see bold action and real substance, not just words. And if the SNP is serious about addressing inequality in Scotland, then it should step out of its own glass house before it throws stones at others. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mark Macdonald to close with the Government Minister till five o'clock, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And uh, it's been a wide-ranging debate, as one might expect. Um, but I want to begin by referencing um, what I was up to earlier on today. I met with pupils from Sheen's Primary School uh, in Edinburgh who were um, discussing with me the mural that they have created uh, around the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. It was, uh, came as a result of a series of uh, children's rights seminars and was a distillation by them of how they see the issues that affect uh, children and young people in relation to their rights. And it begins with a mural which describes what they call the policy factory, which depicts adults making policy as it affects children um, and uh, debating and discussing how those policies will affect children, but also depicts those children on the outside, looking in, unable to give effect and uh, have their voices heard in relation to their rights. But it moves through a series uh, of pictures to the end picture, which they call the Meadow of Rights, a much more harmonious picture, which demonstrates the, the, the benefits of taking a more collaborative and listening approach in relation to the, the, the rights agenda as it pertains to children. That's the approach I intend to take as a minister in relation to uh, how we give effect to and embed further the UNCRC. And one of the commitments that I've made as part of the upcoming Year of Young People is that I will be out uh, across the communities of Scotland discussing with young people directly their rights and how they can participate. 
But I think it also extends further than that to the approach that we've taken as a government in relation to the shaping of our social security agenda, the experience panels which my colleague uh, Jean Freeman has convened to look at how people who have real lived experience of social security can help us to design a system that will give effect to their rights and give effect to their wishes in relation to how they want to see a Scottish social security system shaped. It was a point made, uh, I think, most eloquently by both Claire Adamson and Mary Fee that human rights and the position we've arrived at in relation to human rights uh, is not something which happened at the beginning of time. It's something that has evolved over time and has been hard fought and hard won by a number of individuals throughout history. And therefore, having been hard fought and hard won, it is exceptionally important that we continue to fight to ensure that those rights are protected and advanced wherever possible. And that was the point that I think was brought up by a number of speakers during the course of the debate when they were speaking about some of the potential threats that exist in relation to the current rights framework uh, as, as we, we currently see it. Yes, uh, I'll Polly McNeill. For giving way, I wonder if the Minister agrees that when it comes to enforcing and protecting whether it's human rights or our individual rights, that there is also a need to, to look at the question of legal costs because at the end of the day, there's no point of having laws if being able to enforce the law is not accessible or affordable. Minister. Well, I, I think one of the things that we've taken a very clear view on is that we want to ensure that justice is accessible um, in its broadest sense, and that's something that we are committed to. So I take on board the point that Pauline McNeill raises. Um, I, I think that um, what, what we want to ensure as well um, is that where we can uh, take a collaborative approach, we will, of course, take that collaborative approach. And we've demonstrated that, I think, already in some of the actions that we are taking forward uh, on the rights agenda. Uh, Polly McNeill raised a very specific point in her opening remarks regarding the refusal of entry to a place of detention. Uh, that's a point which uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary, has written to both uh, Robert Goodwill and his successor, Brandon Lewis, uh, in relation to. Um, so it is something that the Scottish Government is very much alive to and is seeking to ensure that the UK Government takes a different approach uh, on. Uh, John Finney uh, very uh, rightly highlighted some of the challenges that have arisen as a result of the examination under the UNCRPD. Um, and uh, this led to what I thought was uh, a quite extraordinary exchange in the chamber when my colleague Ruth Maguire um, asked uh, very, uh, I thought, uh, uh, very rightly asked Adam Tompkins whether he agreed with the conclusions of the chair of the UNCRPD examination whether or not uh, this was a human catastrophe that was being presided over by the UK government. And Adam Tompkins had spent that point up until then saying that the Scottish government needed to take its medicine when it was told that it was not achieving what it should be achieving in relation to the rights agenda. And I would point out that the cabinet secretary in her remarks, the first minister in the programme for government stated quite clearly that we recognise that there is work still to be done. That's why we've convened the expert advisory panel. It's why we've undertaken uh, and committed to an audit in relation to the UNCRC. But having done that, having stood up and said that, he then launched a response which basically said, I reject the findings of the United Nations in relation to the UK government. And here are the reasons why, in actual fact, disabled people in the UK have never had it so good. And it, I think, comes down to the, the crystallisation of the points that have been made previously, is that looking at it only through those examples and not looking at the totality of the experience of disabled people in the UK is, I think, being ignorant to the fact, is being ignorant to the genuine experiences that are uh, being uh, inflicted upon many of our disabled people. And we then came to the debate and the point which Jamie Green made that perhaps we would be better served by a, a wider discussion around the concept of inequality. Well, the Conservatives brought it to the, the table today. They spoke about the attainment gap, which we are committed to addressing. They spoke about health inequalities, which we are committed to addressing. But the point remains that what underpins and underlies those inequalities is in itself systemic societal inequality. And we as a parliament only have so many powers available to us to tackle that systemic societal inequality. And if what we are doing in this parliament, if what our health service is doing in our hospitals, our GP practices across the country, if what our education system is doing in our early learning centres, our schools, our colleges, our universities, is fighting against the chaos and circumstances that surround those people at the very margins of our society, 
we will only be able to advance so far because we have to ensure that what meets those people when they leave those facilities, when they leave those educational facilities, is an environment that works with what is happening in those systems, works to ensure that we deliver the best possible outcomes for people. And if we do not have that situation, then we will not be able to make progress. That is the point that lies underneath this. So it is, it is fine for the Conservatives to come here and for other opposition parties to come here and say this government must do better in certain areas. We accept that there is journeys that we still have to travel in relation to educational attainment, in relation to health inequalities, but they cannot ignore the wider impact of the wider macroeconomic policies, the wider social security policies, which their government administers over, which are having a detrimental impact on our ability to close those gaps and to improve those outcomes for people across Scotland. Presiding officer, in conclusion, this debate, I think, has been a very important one. It has been a very welcome one. It has touched on a number of different areas where we recognise that there is still a road to travel, but we must also acknowledge the significant progress that we are making in Scotland in taking forward the rights agenda, in taking forward uh, the agenda of human rights. We recognise that there is um, work that we have to do collaboratively across this Parliament. That's why we will be happy to support the Labour and Green amendments today. I say to the Liberal Democrats that we will not be supporting their amendment today. Um, and I say that Mike Rumbles uh, is fine for him to come here and say that we have uh, only now seen action in relation to things like, for example, the minimum age of criminal responsibility uh, in areas such as the uh, equal protection. I would just gently point out to Mr Rumbles that he should have a little bit of humility on the fact that his party did have a role in governing this country from 1999 to 2007 and, didn't, and failed to take forward any meaningful advance in either of those areas. A little bit of humility sometimes goes a long way. But in general, presiding officer, we recognise there's a road still to travel, but we also must acknowledge the progress we've made to this point. Thank you. That concludes our debate on dignity, equality and human rights for all. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 7770 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau setting out a revised business programme. I would ask any member who objects to say so now and I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 7770. Formally moved. Thank you very much. No member is asked to speak. Therefore, the question is that we agree motion 7770. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. There are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that Amendment 7740.3 in the name of Pauline McNeill, which seeks to amend Motion 7740 in the name of Angela Constance on dignity, equality and human rights for all be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7740.1 in the name of John Finney, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance and be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Uh, and members be cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7740.1 in the name of John Finney is yes, 85, no, 31. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 7740.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Angela Constance. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote and members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on Amendment 7740.2 in the name of Mike Rumbles is yes, 9, no, 88. 
There were 19 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And the final question is that motion 7740, in the name of Angela Constance, as amended, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division and members will cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion 7740 in the name of Angela Constance as amended is yes 85, no 31. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move to members business in the name of Mary Fee on tackling homophobia in sport. And we'll just take a few moments to change seats. <laughs>